Can you name the first Afro-American composer to have a symphony performed by a major orchestra? Well, if you can't, I'll tell you. It's William Grant Still, and his music is a treasure of our American heritage. I'm Virginia Eskin, and William Grant Still is our featured composer today on A Note to You. February is Black History Month and provides a wonderful excuse to hear music from a composer we all need to know about. William Grant Still was an amazing amalgam of talent. He could play jazz easily, but he aimed his sights higher. He wanted to be taken seriously as a composer of classical music. And he was. As I look over the old newspaper quotes, I see that none other than Jan Sibelius said, he has something to say. And Leopold Stokowski proclaimed, still is one of our greatest American composers. He was able to embrace his African heritage and incorporate native elements into classical music. In just a few minutes, we'll hear from music scholar Catherine Smith. She has come out with a book about William Grant Still. But first, let's listen to some of Still's music. I want you to hear how he was able to meld together the musical styles of his jazz background, his African heritage, and traditional classical music. This is the first movement of Enanga, a chamber work for harp, piano, violin, cello, and bass. <laughs> Thank you. 
was harpist Anne Hobson Pilot with Videmus, a group dedicated to the performance of music by black composers. They played the first movement of Enanga by William Grant Still, our featured composer this week on A Note to You. Let's start at the beginning. In Woodville, Mississippi, where William Grant Still was born in 1895, his father was the town bandmaster, but he died when William was just a few months old and his mother went to stay with relatives in Little Rock, Arkansas. After she got a job as a school teacher, her next task was lining up a violin teacher for William. When I was talking with Catherine Smith, she's a music scholar at the University of Nevada, she mentioned that Little Rock turned out to be a very good place to grow up at the turn of the century. Why is that, I wondered. Because it had a black high school that had a solid academic program. There weren't a lot of those in the South. What happened to him after high school? Well, he went to Wilberforce College. He wasn't, his mother didn't want him to study music, so he didn't. He got his first big break from W.C. Handy. He played with Handy's bands out of Memphis, working in the South. Went eventually, studied at Oberlin for a while, studied composition. There, he, he had to learn the popular tradition. What he wanted was to compose operas. So he had a double life. He worked for, after he worked for W.C. Handy, when he went to New York, he worked for, for Pace and Handy, he worked for U.B. Blake, played in the Shuffle Along Orchestra. Did his mother live long enough to see him become successful? She did indeed. Which Not is nice. much longer than that, but she lived long enough to know that he had shows that he had arranged that played on Broadway that he was arranging for early radio, that he had been the recording director for the first all-black record label, Black Swan. Didn't she want him to become a doctor? Yes. And I think we're, I'm glad he became a composer, <laughs> although I'm sure he would have been a good doctor. <laughs> the Artie Shaw Orchestra, playing one of the arrangements made for them by William Grant Still. But as Catherine Smith says, Still wasn't content with making arrangements for Artie Shaw, Paul Whiteman, and Sophie Tucker. He had other ambitions as well. He was writing classical music, so-called concert music, in the 1920s. It was getting performed from 1925 on, on new music concerts, while he was arranging Broadway shows at the same time. That's the double life. That's the double life. On a tour with the Broadway musical Shuffle Along, he traveled up to Boston and managed to get some composition lessons with George Chadwick, who was the principal of the New England Conservatory. Chadwick saw the potential of this young black composer, and he arranged for a full scholarship for Still. Obviously, Still was an impressive musician. Through the 20s, he continued his double life, playing with Broadway orchestras, arranging popular music, and writing serious classical music on the side. As a black man working in a genre dominated by whites, he had some challenges to face, according to Catherine Smith. Still was often asked, as a composer of classical music, a so-called concert music, really. It wasn't classical. It was concert music. How does this represent your African-American heritage? Because It it wasn't wasn't always as polite as that, but that's really the question. And what he wondered was, how do I represent that heritage? Because I want to be an American voice that speaks in my own voice. You know, one among many voices. So there's a whole series of pieces, and they have titles like Darker America, uh, From the Land of Dreams, uh, Levy Land, a whole series of pieces that were played and heard and very well received. The first major piece that still turned out was the Afro-American Symphony. There are a couple of things to listen for in this. The interjection of blues into a classical composition and the distinct syncopated figures. When he wrote the Afro-American Symphony, one of the things he said was that he really, the blues were, maybe had words that were banal, but that the music was the least touched by Caucasian influences. So he wanted to use it in a way that he could make a genuine fusion where Blues would make a symphony much richer, and the symphony would, the, you know, symphonic style would be expanded. That's Professor Catherine Smith from the University of Nevada talking about the Afro American Symphony of William Grant Still. 
In a couple of minutes, we'll hear the entire work played by the Detroit Symphony Orchestra. Today, on A Note to You, we're highlighting Black History Month and learning some fascinating background about one of our important American composers. I'd like to give you our address now, because I'd like to hear from you. Write me at A Note to You, care of WGBH Radio, 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. The email address is a note to you, all one word, at wgbh.org. And if you write, let us know the call letters of your public radio station. A note to you is made possible by the friends and alumni of Northeastern University. Afro-American Symphony starts out with a beautiful English horn solo. It sounds like a spiritual. Then it moves on to a very sensuous rhythmic passage, which is really a 12-bar blues, and the piece builds and builds on itself. It really shows off his skills as an orchestrator. Listen in the scherzo for something I think you'll find familiar. Here's the Detroit Symphony conducted by Nimi Yarvi with the Afro-American Symphony by William Grant Still. We've just heard the Afro-American Symphony by William Grant Still, played by the Detroit Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Naomi Yarvi. Today, we're exploring the life and music of William Grant Still on A Note to You. I'm Virginia Eskin. If you were listening carefully, and you're a Gershwin fan, you probably thought we were tricking you. Did you hear I Got Rhythm in the third movement? Well, we're not into tricks. So who composed that melody first? One of the people that still encountered in the 20s in New York was the composer George Gershwin. And when you think about it, these two composers had a lot in common, balancing the popular and classical music worlds. Catherine Smith, a music scholar from Nevada, says that I Got Rhythm was a major motivating factor for the Afro-American symphony. In late 1930, Gershwin's show Girl Crazy opened in mid-October, and it contained the hit tune, I Got Rhythm. Still felt that some years earlier he had contributed the rhythm, the melodic motive of I Got Rhythm. Bum, bum, ba, da, That's the dum, one. Bum, ba, da, That's the one. Still was uh, out of a job at that point. He had a lot, of, uh, a lot of freelance things. As soon as he was free, two weeks after Girl Crazy opened, still sat down and began to compose the Afro-American Symphony. He'd been thinking about it for a long time. He wrote it in a big hurry. He just sat down like November 1st. It was done maybe by January 2nd, even with the parts copied out, everything. Boom, boom. That's really fast for writing a symphony. Yes, it is. He both had the time and so... Gershwin using his tune, maybe, or adapting it and making it into something different, led him to sit down and write something he'd been probably been thinking about for a long time. What Still was able to accomplish in this work was important, because he was the first to take folk elements, like the blues and jazz, and incorporate them into a symphonic structure. This empowered jazz and the blues. Listen to the way he brought blues elements into his music for solo violin. Here's the final movement of his Suite for Violin and Orchestra. Still's longtime friend and collaborator Louis Kaufman plays it in an archival recording with the Standard Hour Symphony Orchestra. <laughs> Thank you. 
That was Gammon, the final movement of the suite for violin and orchestra by William Grant Still. As an African-American, the spiritual was Still's birthright. So it's no surprise that he integrated the style of the spiritual into his own music, just as he did with jazz and the blues. One of his most engaging pieces is And They Lynched Him on a Tree for orchestra, two choruses, narrator, and contralto soloist. The poetry comes out of a real incident, according to Catherine Smith. And They Lynched Him on a Tree is somewhat later than the Afro-American Symphony, and it's his protest piece. It's written, uh, it's a setting of a poem by Catherine Garrison Chapin about a real incident. In this case, he had come, once he did it with the Afro-American Symphony, he came to use the blues in all kinds of ways in his music. In this case, it's a sung blues, and the mother of the man who was the victim sings just in the middle of this piece where there are choral sections and other kinds of solos. Here is the mother saying what she thought, how she felt, and using the blues like an aria tells how a character feels about something. She's telling how she feels, and you can't mistake it. That was Music by William Grant Still, a portion of And They Lynched Him on a Tree, sung by Hilda Harris with the Plymouth Music Series Ensemble, conducted by Philip Brunel. Still had a wonderful way with the human voice, don't you think? Here's a cycle called Songs of Separation, five songs set to texts by black poets, sung by Robert Honeysucker with Vivian Taylor at the piano.
That was music by William Grant Still. Songs of Separation. Settings of text by Arna Bontemp, Philippe Toby Marcelin, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, County Cullen, and Langston Hughes. The baritone was Robert Honeysucker, and the pianist was Vivian Taylor. And that's the end of our tribute to the music of William Grant Still, one of the great Afro American pioneers in classical music. I'm Virginia Eskin. This program is a note to you, and if you'd like to write to me, I'd look forward to reading it. The address is 125 Western Avenue, Boston, Massachusetts, 02134. The email is a note to you, all in one word, at wgbh.org. The engineer for today's broadcast is Jim Donahue, and the producer is Alan McClellan. And thanks to Catherine Smith. She's a professor at the University of Nevada. The name of her book is William Grant Still, A Study in Contradictions. A note to you is made possible by the friends and alumni of Northeastern University. It's produced by Northeastern University in cooperation with WGBH Radio, Boston.